Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I just want to give it a couple seconds to let a few other people log on to the session here. Um, but while we're waiting, feel free to input where you're listening from just in the chat function at the bottom of the screen here. Um, we can make sure that is working smoothly. We have Marley listening from Boston. Hi, everyone. Now listening from South Florida, Allie, also from Boston, welcome. Great, well, I see we have a number of people uh, logged onto the session now. Welcome, Sergio, as well, from Colombia. Um, so I will get started here, um, but wanted to welcome you to HALT's Masters in Business Analytics info session and masterclass. Um, during this time, it'll be about a one hour session and you'll have the chance to learn more about the program um, from HALT's Associate Director of Enrollment, Marley, who we have with us today. Um, and after this brief overview, we'll hand this over to Professor Hernandez who will talk you through a masterclass on advanced data analytics. Um, we will allow time for Q&A at the end of the session. So any questions that you have throughout, please feel free to put them either in the Q&A box or the chat box, and I'll get to those um, at the end of the session with the professor. I will now hand this over to Marley. Hi, everyone. Um, hope you all had a great weekend. Thanks for joining us today on the Master in Business Analytics session. My name is Marley Melvin. I'm the Associate Director of Enrollment here in Boston. Um, so before Professor Hernandez gives his master class, I just wanted to provide you guys with a brief overview of the options uh, that we have on campus for you starting this September for our Master's in Business Analytics. Um, so first to let you guys know, we have the full-time in-person Master of Business Analytics in September uh, being offered at the San Francisco and the Boston campus. Um, so this is a one-year program, uh, 11 months actually. So um, this is the, the fastest option for you if you're looking to get a degree within a year. And then we do have some part-time options for our working professionals as well. Um, so there's three op part-time options for you guys. Uh, the part-time on campus, which all of your campus, your, your classes are online. Um, sorry, they are in person. Uh, once a month, you come to campus uh, over a long weekend um, and it's an 18 month program. Then we have our part-time, um, which is a high, hybrid option. So uh, part-time online and then part-time on campus. Um, so this is nice because it gives you a flexibility to work from home as well as get the networking experience. That's also around 18 months. And then finally, our live online, which is for the most part fully online, um, but you can take some electives on campus if you want to at any of our campuses around the world. Um, this is great because it will provide you with minimal disruption to your work life. So um, I will make sure to put uh, my email in the chat for anyone who has additional questions after Professor Omar's masterclass. Great. Thank you, Marley. Um, I will now hand this over to Professor Hernandez. I will let you share your screen and we can begin the class. Perfect. Great. So first of all, we're very excited to have you all here and showing some interest on this class, on this subject. Believe it or not, whether we want it or not, this is just getting a lot of attention. It's now impossible for you to think about a long-term career that does not include a component on data analytics. Those old times when we used to have just the older people, the best salary people just making all the calls, those that are just fading away little by little. Why? Because now there are three main inputs that capture the attention of a lot of companies before they make a decision. These three inputs are data, data, and data. And some of us may wonder, okay, uh, what if I just didn't have enough background on the analytics portion when I was doing my career or my subject? But still, I see that there is that big need in front of us. 
How could I catch up on that? Assuming that's one of the questions that some of us have in mind, the fact that you want to find a way really to embrace, to feel comfortable about making decisions that are data-driven, then I have prepared this short, this short class for, for you. What I'm going to be doing at the beginning is just to open up with a brief introduction of myself and then ask a couple of questions to you so that you can have a chance to gauge how comfortable you are, you, you are with the use of data. And then I'm going to present to you a short, a short exercise where we are going to try to see what your intuition tells you against what data might tell you. And right after that, we're going to start just wrapping up. So the first thing I should tell you when we are just teaching on this class, I mean, you can check on, on I, I won't read the slides, by the way, that's just also a property. Uh, I hate reading slides, and I hope that you guys hate people reading slides to you because that's most of the time the way we run classes there. Uh, the only thing I want, I'm using this slide now just to tell you for disclosure that even if the class and the program is about business analytics, well, I have never ever studied business myself. As you can see there, I first graduated as a chemical engineer, and then I did graduate studies on operations research like applied math, and eventually I switched and did a PhD on economics and environment. And that's the area that I'm working now. Uh, in terms of job, I have been working before, I used to work at Procter & Gamble on research and development, a lot of data there. Then I moved into the oil and gas industry. I passed through consulting and that's when I spent some years and when I just started getting abreast of the business side of the story. And then I moved into the public sector, which is, I was working on the, on the Ministry of the Environment and Natural Resources. The reason I gave you this brief on the background where you could see, oh, this guy comes from different disciplines. You might read there that I have worked and studied at six different countries. Is because that's pretty much the profile of the vast majority of instructors of this organization. So I'm just, uh, I, I, until some extent, I'm kind of the profile that you might be seeing when you just join a class with us. It's not only that we're expected to have a, a, a broad a set of backgrounds uh, from our students, but we are also trying to walk our own talk. And that's what we got here. Now, let's think about something. I, I'm gonna start with a quick questionnaire. And I ask if you have a piece of paper just next to you to try to answer a series of questions that I'll have for you. And that will give us a sense to understand how comfortable you are with the use of data. If you really feel you're data driven or not. Now. As soon as I start showing you these questions, the only thing we you have to do is to answer, just to give a one if the answer is yes, a zero if the answer is no, or you can also give yourself half a point. We're in data analytics, but let's just not go beyond your, those three options, zero, half a point, or one point. And at the end, we're gonna count our tally marks. So on the first one, if you see just here at the top, do you push decisions to the lowest possible level? Is that, uh, is that you really try to get the information, try to understand what lies behind everything that we are doing? Would you just push the decisions up to that level? Think about that, Ali, Serena, and just give a zero or a number one in that answer. Then think about the other one. Do you bring as much diverse data and as many diverse viewpoints in any situation as you can possibly do it? Or you just feel comfortable saying, you know, I have my ideas, I have my background, just let me try to quickly understand this and based on that, you make a call. How open are you at trying to bring the opinion of other people? Seriena, I know that in Michigan, they, they push a lot to try just to, to, to look for that. Chanel, what do you think about that? Just go, uh, go and answer a question on that area. And then for the other question, oh, I can see that my hair does not let you see the other question. Let me move because my hair is, is blocking you. Do you use data to develop a deeper understanding of the business context and the problem at hand? Do you really use data or do you just read a couple of things? So go and answer a zero, one, or half a point. Then those of you who have involved on this type of decisions, you know that there is one big property on, behind most of the data that you are gonna be using. 
and that is variation. Do you develop an appreciation for variation or do you just go ahead and use an average number and with that you try to do your analysis? Then many times we might not be 100% sure about the, the data we have. Do you deal reasonably well with uncertainty? Because that's connected to data quality. And do you integrate your understanding of the data and its, and its implication also with your intuition? Because remember, we are talking about a data analytics master. We are not talking only about a data science master. In a data science master, most of what you will be doing is just getting into the complexities, the code, the programming, the statistics, and so on. But on this program we are running, we want to make sure that you go all the way up and that you are able to recommend a decision and provide some arguments for that, an action plan. That's what we call it business analytics, because you need to go and do four things. You need to understand the motivation, the reason you are doing things. Then you need to discuss the methods. What are the options you can go about that? Then we can crunch the numbers, of course, do the mechanics, but then we need to go and also try to provide a recommendation. What will happen out of that? Are you comfortable doing that? Answer that yourselves. So from the previous one, most of you should have a number between zero and six. Let's look at the next seven and last questions. And here we have it. So do you recognize the importance of high quality data? Did you make some investments or some efforts to really try to have data of as good of a quality as possible? Try to think about that, Emily. Do you really do it when you're just trying to understand what's going on? Then do you conduct experiments to supplement the data you have to answer new questions? Imagine that the question is here, Jacob, John, if you have to decide whether to invest on a new open store in one location or the other, or if you are not sure about one type of design over the other, if you don't know if you should go just push forward with one promotion or the other, all of those kind of decisions can be tackled also in part with the use of experiments, validation of a couple of hypotheses that we may have. Are you all guys comfortable doing that? Try to say. Then almost there, did you recognize that decision criteria can vary depending on the circumstances? What works well for one problem does not necessarily represent what will work well for all the other problems. We need to keep on having a good understanding of the motivation and the context when we are making our calls. Moving faster, do you realize that making a decision is only the first step? That's very important at hold. Making a decision is only the first step. Then you have to go and review that as new data comes on. You have to feel comfortable making short, medium, and long-term calls, understanding variations, understanding trends. That's information that the data itself will give you. Moving there, check on this one, Maria Fernanda. I work to learn new skills and bring new data. In my opinion, all of you should have already a number one here. And the reason is that you're already checking at new opportunities to keep on getting better at understanding data and your prepare your academic preparation. Moving there, I strive to be a role model when it comes to data and work with leaders, peers, and subordinates to try to create a data-driven culture. Risha, I don't know from what part of India you are, but but that's I, I know that there is a, a big a big respect for the use of data, and in, in based on what I could see on your background. Uh, but do you feel that that has permeated a world well in the entire organization or how much you do that to make that happen? And Yeji Proma, help me on this last one. Do you learn from your mistakes and help others to do that as well? Because nobody is the big expert on business analytics, nobody. So how comfortable we are about learning from our mistakes and making a, a better uh, and being better and having a better organization. Now, with these 13 questions, we already come up with a list of scores that may go between zero and 13. You don't have to share your answer, but just tell me, if you score seven points or more, 
I feel that to some extent, you feel comfortable making your decisions based on data, but you wish you had developed even more skills in that sense, because you realize that the economy, the paths, the new jobs are moving in that direction. Those of us who score less than seven points, well, you are still in a very good time to change that, to make things into, turn things into the right direction. Why? Because as an example, for many of the classes that we run at Holt, and before you even join the program, what we have done is to recognize that behind our big strength, which is an heterogeneous class with a lot of different background, we also need to understand that some of us are more comfortable with the use of data than others. But to make sure we have a play and even feel for everyone, we have prepared material that we invite people to start learning on their own. We kind of coach them, guide them a few months earlier so that you start just catching up on this. This is just a place, a beautiful master's, and we have tested that. For instance, I know that some of you come from media studies, some of you did business, some of you did economics and so on. We find always a way to try to make sure that all of us, a few months earlier, start getting ready so that when you perform in the program, you do it very well. I guarantee you that that's possible. So even if you have a score at the lowest portion of this area, the big news is that that's something that can be reversed. And we have tested that before. Now, let's try to look into an example when we are gonna have a chance to, to compare our intuition and our call for results based on data. For this one, <clears throat> Just a quick question, uh, Jacob, if I may ask you just a question out of the spot, and, and I don't know if you can talk and if not, just, just write it in the chat. I'm gonna have an example, Jacob, in this case, uh, about sustainability. In this case, you know that there is this trend where cars need to become more energy efficient. You need to find a way to have more mobility by using less energy. Let's just for a second move away from electric vehicles. We can talk about that later. But think, but think about gasoline, traditional vehicles. Can you think of any decisions they have made in the last years to make the cars more energy efficient so that you can drive longer miles with the same one gallon? You wanna write something, Jacob? If anyone else wants to write something, we go and check it out. What can we do to make sure that my car can be driven for more miles with the same one gallon of gasoline? Hmm. Any ideas over there? We're also able to unmute people if you would, uh, if you'd like anyone to speak in particular. Oh yes, if someone raises the hand or so on, we can just put it, yeah. or just in the chat. Is it possible to write in the chat? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so he said, no worries, Jacob. Just checking if, if, if you can type one idea or anyone on our audience, one idea of what can we do to make sure that uh, the vehicles we are producing become more energy efficient, efficient, that with one gallon of gasoline, you can drive more miles. One decision you might make on that? Retrofit to add alcohol, that's a very good one because that will have less emissions. That's a good call, John, I like it a lot. What else can we do to make sure that our car becomes, that the new generation of cars become more energy efficient? I give you a hint, time ago, most of the cars were manufactured out of steel. Look into the type of fuel channel, I like that a lot, yes, definitely. Or the material, also the material, that's very important. It's not a surprise that year after year, less vehicles are made out of steel and now they use aluminum or other type of composites. Why? Because that reduces the weight of the vehicle and increases, increases the efficiency. Just with that background in mind, I'm gonna ask you a favor. Think about this situation. There is a business decision you're about to make. I need your help. Assume that you work in a company and within that company, in the sales uh, team that you are leading, there are only two types of vehicles. Some of them are the SUVs, 
which can get you 10 miles per gallon. And the other type of vehicles that you will have there are sedans that give you 20 miles per gallon. And let's assume that in all cases, they use the cars for 10,000 miles per year. That's the background. And then leave everything the same. There's the same number of cars of one type, the same number of cars of the other type. All of them drive 10,000 miles. Let's not change a lot of things. Now, this is the decision, and this is where I need your help. You only have enough money, enough resources to change one of these two models. And your goal is to help your, your company to save money. You want to lower operating costs. How would you do that? By saving more on gasoline. Now, you have two options. Option number A will be that you go and ahead and replace the 10 miles per gallon vehicles for a 20 miles per gallon one. The other option you will have is that you just change the other car, the 20 miles per gallon vehicle, and you use one of 50 gallons. Now, take 10 seconds, please, and try to tell me, would you decide to replace the 10 miles gallons that will give you now 20 or the 20 miles per gallon vehicles for once of 50 miles per gallon? Take a few seconds and then just give me an A or a B as an answer. We cannot say all of them, none of them or so on, just, just one or A or B, okay? Ali, you're saying A, Richard is saying A, Jacob is saying B. Okay, we have. Gabriel, I'm curious, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Seriani saying A, A, okay. Yeah, he goes for A, okay. Proma, what would you say? What's your call? I sat to A. Oh, you did media studies. I was sat to. I was reading also. I went through all your LinkedIn, guys. That's a very nice degree. Now, if you agree, we have few of us who will go for option A. Few of us will go for option B. Let's try to dig deeper into that and see what happens. First, we're going to go and check. What would happen if you replace vehicles of 10 miles per gallon for vehicles of 20 miles per gallon? And friendly reminder, we were assuming that all these vehicles are driven for 10,000 miles, okay? So with that in mind, if you have a vehicle of 10 miles per gallon efficiency, and you drive that for 10,000 miles, then you will be consuming 1,000 gallons of gasoline. But if instead you have another vehicle that will give you 20 miles per gallon, then you will be consuming 500 gallons and your savings will be equal to the difference between both scenarios. That will be 500 for the first one. In a similar way, if now, we, if now we focus on option B, you already know that for the 20 miles per gallon, that was a 500 gallons consumption. Let's see what happens if now we have a vehicle that will consume, 50, will give you 50 miles per gallon, then your gas consumption will be 200. But your savings, again, given as the difference between two scenarios, the savings will not be that good. So the right answer for this problem will just be that we go for A. Some of us hit on that correctly and some of us probably what, what came to our head is that we just quickly analyze it. Okay, what difference is larger? Moving from 10 to 20 or moving from 20 to 50? Oh, this one looks like a lot more of a difference. I might go for that option. Now, here is something that I want you to use on your advantage from now on. 
The reason some of us say B is because 100% of the people in the world, we tend to have a linear thinking. We think linearly in a nonlinear world. But if you see the relationship between gallons used and miles per gallon is not linear. In fact, it was looking like this. So as you start moving more to the right, the difference in savings will be smaller than what it was at the beginning. That's the big takeaway that I want you to embrace. Because one push we constantly do in this program is that we try to help our students to get ahead of the game, to get ahead of some trends, to get ahead of the way most people think, because we are confident that that's what will make you different. That's what will push your career up. And this is not a surprise. This time I show you an example about an area just for efficient vehicles, sustainability. But these type of examples happen everywhere, everywhere. Even you can even go beyond the traditional uh, business uh, entities that you know, organizations. Just think even about sports. These fellows that you see there are those, uh, you, I hope you, you have seen that, that film and if not just watch it, uh, Moneyball. They told you in these organizations, this is about baseball if you like it, the A's. Uh, this is an organization that has to use like 10, 20% of the budget that the richest teams use. So there is no way for them to buy the best players. They have to find a different way to compete. And they do that by adopting aggressively some data analysis practices. And they found a way to move from this bunch of experts who are important, of course, into data-driven approaches. Not a surprise that even with that tiny budget, year after year, this team finds a good way to become competitive in this league. So your homework for this master class, if you had a chance, very funny homework, is that I invite you to go and watch that film because that will not only show you how they use data, but they show you how they had to transform the organization because many of the things you will have to learn on our program, it's about leadership and about culture. Remember, we just don't want you to be good at analysis. We want you to be good at the business itself. And, a la and a, as a last piece of work, when you watch that film, I constantly get asked the same question. Oh, Omar, are you on that film? No, no, ladies, that's not me. That's another person. I know we both look very similar. You see here? But no, I'm not an actor. You see the difference? I use a tie and Brad Pitt does not. Uh, but this is a takeaway. Those to become, and I, and I wanted to put as a phrase, those who become data-driven, they tend to get ahead of the game. Now you just have to ask yourselves, where do you wanna be in one year, three years, five years from now? And how do you think that a program like this can help you achieve your dreams? That's at the end, the big story of the day. I'm open for any questions you may have. Thank you for the attention. Well, thank you so much, that was great. Um, as Professor Hernandez said, if you have any questions, feel free to input them in the chat function, um, just or in the QA box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, I'll give everyone about 30 seconds or so to input your questions. Um, but that was very insightful. Also feel free to, if you have any questions about the actual program, um, we also have uh, Marley back as well. Just a minute here. All right, thank you. Well, it doesn't look like we have any questions coming in, um, but if you do think of any, I know sometimes it takes a minute to let all of that information marinate. So please email admissions at halt.edu and I'm happy to pass these questions along. But I do wanna say thank you so much to Professor Hernandez and thank you Marley as well for taking time to uh, briefly review the program. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees for joining. It was wonderful to have you. Um, if you're interested in any of our future events or masterclasses, you can go to halt.edu slash events um, and register there. Um, let's see if we have anything coming in in the chat function here. We actually do have one question, um, Professor Hernandez. 
In the five years of work experience, I have worked uh, mostly on Microsoft Excel. How can I get a head start for the program? That's a good question. Perfect. I love that question. That, that's very common. So number one, um, you will not get rid of Excel because still nowadays, it is one of the most commonly tools adopted outside the market. So it's good that you have that. And remember, every time you have a not so large set of data, Excel can do a very good job at statistical analysis, regression, comparisons, and so on. Now, the challenge comes when you start having more and more data. Some of that data that at one point may not even fit into your computer, your laptop, big data. So as you start having more information, then you need to move to another type of, of uh, packages. In this program, we make sure that our students cover two types of things. You start with Python, and then you move with R. There's a lot of discussion about which one of them is better, but here we think that you need to be good at both of them. Now, the, the, the question next to that is for people like probably like, like you, when you were sharing, saying, hey, I feel I'm okay with Excel, but I have not do, done coding in a while, probably never. Well, don't worry, because that's the idea. Uh, learning Python and learning R is not rocket science. But the fact that it is a language gives you already a lot of insight. It's difficult to learn a language just from one day to the other, from one week to the other. So what we do is that we try to give you some small bits for you to start preparing. And believe it or not, it's also the back of your head who starts getting ready for that. Because this thing will just activate the brain a lot and will help you think in different ways. So how do you get a head start on that? by accessing some of our, the material or the links that we're gonna have for you. And some people tend to start one, two or three months earlier. We don't want anyone just to become an expert since the beginning. If you can, that's good. But we just want everyone to have a sort of a constant pace because that's really what will bring you in very good shape when you start. So we, we, we can give access to some material. For, and in fact, we do it so that people start earlier. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we do have another question. I'm going to give this to Marley and then Professor Hernandez, if you want to jump in afterwards, feel free. Um, Gabriel would like to know, Marley, what is the difference or the main difference between the online and the in-person version of the program? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the main difference, and Professor Hernandez, you can also give your input on this as well, maybe teaching both. Um, but the main difference I would say is the networking opportunities that you're going to get. Um, obviously being virtual, it's going to be very similar to this style that Professor Hernandez did today. Um, so if you're comfortable with that, um, then that's great. But you also will have the option to come to the physical campus and network um, with your cohort. Um, and just being on the physical campus, it's definitely a different learning experience overall. So Professor Omar, you can give your input on this as well. Yes, thank you. So to start, to start with Gabriel, uh, the academic objectives are the same, whether you try one program or the other. And then most of what we do is to try to give you the option. Why? Because some people will feel they are prepared to just stay where they are physically, geographically, and just try to accommodate probably their work or family things with the time they spend on the program. Some of the people will feel that part of the reason they sign for this program is because they're after the physical interaction of hanging out with more people, like the school type or so on. Uh, at the end, we feel that that's more of a personal choice. So what we are trying to do on this side of the story is to make sure that whether you pick one option or the other, you both fulfill the same academic goals that we have there. Mm -hmm. That's helpful, thank you. Um, this question is for Professor uh, Omar. John would like to know, do we get projects and the opportunity to work with experts on projects? Yes, for most of the classes you have here, June, uh, you're gonna have a project, a final project. Now, very important, you need to start feeling comfortable uh, at working with people in teams because the majority of the projects are team projects. And that's also another characteristic that we sell when we are at Hope. We try to, make, to show the employers outside that what, once they work with a whole student, well, they will have the guarantee that that person 
can just work literally with any type of people, any type of teams, because that's where we get you with different nationalities, profiles, and so on. Now, some of the projects we have are related either, I can give you some examples. In the case of the, the class of introduction to data and advanced data analytics, we gave you a large database with plenty of columns, like 25 columns, hundreds of pieces of information and so on. And you needed to develop some insights out of that, that eventually you will connect to a promotion, a marketing promotion program and see what segments you will be tailoring, what type of activities you'll be running and so on. For Python, R and, and machine learning, we also have projects. And on this project, same story, we're, we're playing just with some big databases that we're gonna give it to you. We try to walk you on the challenge of, of just deploying that. And there is also the option for many classes that either you bring your own data or that you allow us to share some data that where we can all just start working on that. Why? Because some of you have worked on this before, realize that many times the biggest challenge we have with the data is to gather it, to clean it, to organize it, to make sure that it's of good quality. And then we run all the type of analysis. So yes, you will have projects most of the time. And we do have another one, if that's okay. Yes, um, yes, it's okay. Okay, great. Um, let's see, now, is it Rishab? Am I pronouncing that incorrectly? I apologize if I am. Um, has enrolled in the dual degree program, uh, one year MBA and then master's in business analytics. Um, what? How much time will this person spending in class? Like what is the, what does that look like on a weekly basis? Okay, uh, out of caution, I'm not sure about that uh, because the people I know who are doing the dual degree, they first do one and then they start the other one. So I don't feel that they are concurrently doing both degrees at the same time. Is that what you're asking, Rich? And Marley, if you want to chime in a little bit as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so on this, yeah, I, I'm not sure in terms of like what the timing, I, I think Professor Omar would probably have the best insight because I just work with the student up until they get to the classroom. So um, I'm not really sure. I wish I could answer, give you a better answer for that. Um, Most of, yeah. No, please go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. I was going to ask you what, how long is one of your typical classes? Maybe that would help. Yes. Most of the classes that we run uh, take two or three hours and we meet with students like two or three times a week, depending on the class that we have. Uh, now, students tend to have like three classes every quarter or so, and that's, that's more or less the, the approximate timing. And, but we can do that. The, the, the number of hours of class time is something we can calculate because every single master is connected to a number of, of credit units. And each one credit units represents 10 hours of contact, direct contact. So I, th I think that that's a way to uh, just to go and, and get on the numbers. Um, this question is from Marley. Um, is it recommended to do the dual, or I guess either of you, but is it recommended to do the dual degree program as the analytics portion is an accelerated six month program? Is the full year more beneficial? Hmm. Um, go yeah. ahead, Professor no, no, Omar. Well, I was saying um, that that's, that, that's really a personal choice and depends among other things on how much time you, you know you can truly dedicate on it. There is an option also where people do, I feel like an MBA and they try to concentrate their electives on analytics, or analytics classes on that. And there are others who first do the MBA and then focus on the Master of Business Analytics class. I understand, but, but here you might be better than I to, to know that, that those of you who do the program of Master of Science and Business Analytics will also have the chance to receive an OPT that can last up to three years. So you can work up to three years in America. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just mentioning that because I know from other students that sometimes they try to come up with a package. They wanna have the American experience academically and combine that with the opportunity of working here. Thank you. Um, all right, let's see. I'm just going to, looks like we have just one more question here. Yeah, um, yeah, of 
and this is for you, Professor Hernandez. Um, will we be reviewing other tech functions such as SQL's basic coding or an overall distinguishment of all the differences of data analytics and computer sciences? Uh, no, to be honest, on this program, we focus on SQL and that's where you have a class. The class we're I'm talking about is called a data a strategy and within data strategy, there's a conversation about other programs, but that's more of a business type of class. And then we boil it down to another class where we get to talk about a database design and with a big focus on SQL. So we are not covering anything different than SQL in terms of analysis uh, software for databases. Great, thank you. Yeah, um, of course. All right, everyone in the audience, any other questions? Feel free to, again, put those in the chat function. Um, but thank you so much uh, for Professor Hernandez and Marley for going through those, really appreciate it. Um, again, if you have any questions, please email admissions at halt.edu. Um, a recording of this session will go out to everyone afterwards if you wanna go back and rewatch. And if you're interested in um, our follow-up Masters in Business Analytics um, event, this will take place on February 22nd. And we'll dive into Masters in Business Analytics uh, graduate opportunities, um, what your career could look like. And then we'll also have some alumni that you'll be able to speak with as well. Um, all right, so thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Stay in touch, guys. Bye, everyone.